Hello again. I have over the last few days looked at a couple of children's books on race, both of which left much to be desired, to say the least of it. I want to look today at one published last year by David Olusoga, who is an historian who was born and raised in Nigeria, although he now lives in Britain. He is described by the University of Manchester, where he works, as an expert on military history. Some viewers might have seen him on television. Since he is a recognised historian, I shall assume that he researches the topics about which he writes, and that if he misleads people or misses out vital information, then he does so deliberately. I want to look at this book of his today which is called Black and British, A Short Essential History. It's meant for children, and I find the contents genuinely disturbing, because in it, Olusoga says many things which he must know to be untrue and likely to inflame ill feeling in the young people reading it. Let's dive straight in and look at chapter one. The very first sentence is intended to mislead, although strictly speaking true. He writes that Africans first came to Britain with the Roman Empire. Since the title of the book is Black and British, anybody reading the word Africans in this context will assume that he is referring to black Africans. He's not. He's writing of Phoenicians and Berbers from the Mediterranean coast. He goes on to deal with the so-called Ivory Bangle Lady, a Roman skeleton found in York, who has become the poster girl for those who wish to pretend that black people have always lived in Britain. I've gone into this subject at greater length in um, another video. I'm sure people can find it if they search. He says, and I quote, da, 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 da talking of the archaeological examination of the skeleton, when they studied the chemical isotopes in her bones, they found she hadn't grown up in York. Instead, she could have spent her childhood somewhere like North Africa. Well, hmm, OK. She could have spent her childhood on Mars, if it comes to that, or Australia or in Florida. But there's no reason at all to suppose that she did. Information about her childhood comes from analysing the strontium and oxygen isotopes in her teeth. I give a link to the original research on her teeth in the description to this video. I recommend people read it. The conclusion was that she did not grow up where she was found, that's to say, near York. After discussing various possibilities, the team concluded that, in summary, the oxygen and strontium isotope evidence suggests that ST60, that's the ivory bangle lady, spent her childhood either in the west of Britain or perhaps more likely in compatible, possibly coastal areas of Western Europe or the Mediterranean. Why did David Olusoga not cite this if he wished to be accurate and objective? The reason is he wanted to get in the word Africa and hint that she was black. The famous black trumpeter of Tudor times <laughs> makes the inevitable appearance in the book. Um, it's when we reach Olu Soka's account of black people in Britain during the 20th century that the real deceptions begin. Not to mention some of the most awful schoolboy howlers about basic historical facts. On page 152... For example, we are solemnly assured that 60,000 British soldiers died on the first day of the Battle of the Somme in 1916. This is absolute nonsense. I suggest that viewers try just looking quickly, googling the Battle of the Somme and seeing how many British soldiers actually did die that day. Just over 19,000 British soldiers died on the first day of the Somme, 19,240 to be precise. Why does Olusoga say 60,000 died? 
I'm guessing that he's seen somewhere that there were 57,000 British casualties that day, which there were, and he didn't bother to check how many of these were wounded and how many actually died. And this is the man who is a professor at Manchester University and described by his employers as an expert on military history. <laughs> I don't think so. He describes the um, West Indies Regiment, which consisted of 15,000 men, black men from the Caribbean, and says of it, still on page 152, da, da, da. they had one major region, speaking now of the British government, <coughs> they had one major region, reason for not letting black regiments fight in Europe, it would break a basic rule of colonialism, giving weapons and training to black men from the colonies and sending them to fight Europeans went against the colonial rule that black people should not be permitted to kill white people. This is quite untrue, and I'm sure he knows it. I'm fairly sure he's telling a deliberate lie. Men of colour, to use the modern jargon, were vital fighting men from the very beginning of the First World War. I invite viewers to Google Sikhs fighting France, 1914. Just try it. Have a look at the images associated with it. They'll soon find loads of fierce Indian soldiers whose support was crucial in many battles. For example, the First Battle of Ypres, 1914. The idea that the British had a basic rule of colonialism, as Olu Soga puts it, that such men should not be allowed to fight Europeans or kill white people is a complete lie. It is an invention. The author has made it up. I hardly know how else to put the case. Let's turn to page 154 <coughs> and look at a section headed Post-War Ingratitude in big letters. See? Post-War Ingratitude. Right. After the war, the African and West Indian regiments which had fought for Britain were not invited to march in the official victory parade in London. Many black soldiers went home disappointed at the way they had been treated. They had met, worked and fought with people from across the empire, but they had also been reminded that they were seen as less important than white people. Here's a photograph of what he describes as the Victory Parade in 1919. Uh, by the way, this is another thing which is either a lie or a terribly sloppy piece of research on Olu Soga's part. The um, event in London on July the 19th, 1919, of which he writes and shows a photograph, was not a victory parade at all. I don't know why on earth he says this. Um, it was actually called the Peace Day Parade. It was part of nationwide celebrations of peace, not victory. You see what he's doing here. He's trying to make the thing sound more militaristic in keeping with his distorted view of the British Empire. I imagine that Peace Day Parade sounded too, well, peaceful. <laughs> And so he calls it instead a victory parade. Very sharp practice for an expert in military history, I am forced to observe. So why was the West Indies Regiment not present that day? It was nothing to do at all with this, their being seen as less important as white people, as Olu Soga claims. There were many Indians and other troops there from across the empire, the Sikhs were cheered up roariously when they appeared. The reason that the West Indies Regiment was not invited to take place was because seven months earlier they had mutinied and been disarmed by another regiment. This took place in the Italian town of Taranto, T-A-R-A-N-T-O. Anybody can look it up, it loads about it on the internet, in December 1918. Men from the Worcestershire Regiment were called in to disarm the mutineers. After that, it was felt that allowing these mutinous men to have rifles again might not be the best idea, and the regiment was demobilised, the men returning to the Caribbean, so that they weren't even in Europe at the time of the um, Peace Day Parade. 
I'm sure that David Olusoga knows about this and chooses not to talk of it. Next, he writes of the riots in various port cities in 1919, um, when black and white people fought each other with knives and guns. In fact, more white people than black were killed in those disturbances because the black sailors who were chiefly involved were more likely to be armed with pistols. Here is what Olusoga says about one particular incident. This is on page 158. The riots spread to Liverpool where several hundred black men were out of work. On one night of fighting, somebody called the police. They raided a house and a young black man snuck out. Sn I think he means sneaked out. I don't know why black is always in capital letters, but still. A young black man snuck out of a back door to escape. He was a 24-year-old sailor from Bermuda named Charles Wooten. The angry crowd out in the street spotted him running away and chased him for over a mile to the dock. At the water's edge, he either fell or was pushed into the water. Before a policeman could reach him, Charles Wooten was hit on the head by a stone thrown from the crowd and died. No one was ever arrested for his murder. Well, that sounds like a case of lynching, doesn't it? Right, this really is misleading to the point when we can call it a downright lie. There's no mention of the shooting of three policemen in that account, is there? On June the 4th, 1919, a white man asked a black man in a pub for a cigarette. The black man refused and a punch-up followed. By the way, this is nothing at all to do with English racism. The white people involved in the fight were actually Scandinavian sailors. The following day, the black guy returned to the pub with his friends who were armed with knives and razors. And there was a huge fight. A policeman passing by tried to intervene and he was slashed with a cutthroat razor. This all turned into a bit of a riot and the black men retreated to their lodging house which was soon surrounded by a chief, uh, large mob, chiefly white people, uh, some English, some Scandinavian. The police turned up and tried to restore order and a black man started shooting at them from a window. Sergeant Getty was struck in the neck by a bullet and two of other officers were also wounded. The gunman, this is a Charles Wooten who's written about here, tried to escape from the back of the house and he was chased by the police and some of the crowd. He fell in the harbour and drowned. This is all a bit different from Olusoga's account, I'm sure you'll agree. Page 195. More lies. In 1981, 13 young people, all of them black, died when a house in the New Cross area of London was consumed by fire. They had been attending a birthday party. The police ruled out the possibility that the fire had been started deliberately, and when pushed by the families, they dismissed suggestions that if the fire had been an arson attack, there might have been racial motives behind it. I, as I say, complete lies. The only reason the police were involved in the first place was because they thought this was arson. They didn't think it was a racist attack for the simple reason that some of the people at the party had told them there had been a fight and some gate crashers had been ejected. The fire had started inside the house and been started by somebody who was present there that night. Only black people were in the house, which ruled out the National Front, or indeed any white person, so there was absolutely no reason to think there was a racial motive. Actually, someone had um, poured nail varnish remover over some curtains and an armchair and started the fire, probably as an act of spite because of the ill feeling resulting from the fight, but that's another matter. It certainly wasn't a racist murder of 13 black people. Right, page 196. When in March 1981, around 20,000 black people marched from Deptford in South London to the centre of the city demanding a thorough investigation, sections of the press reported the predominantly peaceful march as a day of 
riots. Well, the reason that some sections of the press reported the march as a riot was, uh, well, because of the rioting. The thumbnail to this video shows black youths looting a jeweller's shop in Fleet Street that day. This was the first looting during a riot seen in London for half a century. Um, so it was certainly newsworthy. Other buildings had windows broken, police cars were attacked, 17 police officers ended up in hospital, and white passers-by were attacked and robbed. Naughty newspapers were reporting that riot. I could go on all day about this wicked and mischievous book, which appears to have been written with the sole intention of inflaming friction between different ethnicities in Britain. Uh, I note that Olu Soga has been awarded the OBE for Services to Community Integration. The mind positively boggles at the thought. 